Hi, everyone. Um, hope everyone's doing well in quarantine or social distancing right now. Uh, not going too stir crazy. Okay, so um, probably a lot of you are already familiar at this point with the kind of Allen NLP, um, well, the Allen AI research challenge on coronavirus. Um, but anyways, if you aren't, I'll just very briefly say they basically released this large data set, around 45,000 scholarly articles, and the idea is to kind of look and see which ones are the most useful for answering specific questions about the virus. Um, so you can, you can read this later if you haven't already seen it. I won't go into too much more details. But uh, one of the really cool things I think that came out of this kind of immediately, unlike a lot of other Kegel challenges, um, was there was immediately kind of a cooperative effort instead of a really competitive effort from the get-go. So this group kind of cor called Corona Y formed. Um, and now we have over 500 members, I believe, on our Slack. And, and a lot of people are specifically working in teams in a very organized way to try to address some of the real prob problems and the progress we can kind of make on this issue. Um, so I found that very interesting. Uh, if you're interested in joining the group, we're always looking for new people um, and I can send you over the Slack later. Um, specifically what I'm working on, um, and for some of you this may be kind of review though, um, is, is looking at kind of forming good sentence embeddings or good general purpose embeddings so to do semantic search on this corpus. Um, one of my kind of interests for a while has been uh, using transformers to kind of do effective representation learning. Some of that has actually been even on the time series side, but returning more to the NLP side for the moment, I really wanted to see uh, if I could find some good useful representations. And one of the really challenging things I think about this task in, in a sense is that uh, we, have, we have no real evaluation metrics. All evaluation is qualitative and we really have to rely kind of on, and many, moreover, I guess many of us don't even really know what would be good results. So we really have to return, rely on experts to evaluate what, what the results are and if they make sense. But I just wanted to kind of develop using kind of these embeddings and my knowledge of clustering a good way to quickly cluster things and make it so that the experts could see if you know those things kind of make sense. So, um, so yeah, I kind of wrote out this notebook um, very quickly. Um, the, the top part probably you're all used to just downloading and installing. My main questions are just kind of with this notebook, are raw embeddings useful? You know, how can we construct uh, an efficient semantic search using these embeddings? Because there's always a trade-off between doing like a full semantic search and the memory required, uh, which I found all too well when this started repeatedly crashing due to lack of RAM. Um, and then the other big thing is like, as I said, what does the embedding space look like? If we display the embedding space and have experts look at it, what can they tell us whether it makes sense? Um, and, and specifically since Levano did ask me to say this earlier, um, I will say it right now, there's a lot of like machine learning going around with people not really understanding the problem space uh, and not always understanding how it impacts, impacts stuff in a clinical sense or in a medical sense. Um, I know I don't know that by myself, so I always wanna try to rely on medical experts to try to evaluate my results and look at those and I think you should follow all good machine learning best practices, but then also, in addition, really try to collaborate and you know form these cross team collaborations because uh, we can't solve it on our own as machine learning experts. We need that expert advice. Um, so without further ado, I'll just quickly run through some of this. Um, so as I say, I wanted to just, at this point, I just kind of want to see how these vanilla cyber embeddings perform. So I just essentially loaded the model. Um, I did a very naive embedding method. I basically took the average across all word embeddings. Just, um, later, I'll show you how I refined this a bit. Um, and then, you know, I did some basically co basic cosine similarity scores. Um, some of these seem to actually give meaning kind of here. We do see like a high correlation, for instance, between coronavirus and MERS, um, coronavirus and a random word. You know, there's still a high correlation, so obviously that's not great. Um, moving through, um, kind of just did some of our helper functions. And then what I really wanted to do, as I said, 
plot the embedding space. So I actually used UMAP, um, which I find really useful. Uh, I kind of like, it's one of my go-to dimensionality reduction techniques. So with that, I kind of just plotted the article title embeddings, just using this naive method. And it was kind of nice to see, at least in my own unexpert opinion, having just said that, that like, you know, certain things do seem to form like distinct kind of patterns on the cluster. Like here we can see like health capacity management. Uh, I know that's kind of going off screen, but um, that's pretty much the only thing, the only thing uh, in, in the kind of this area. Then if we look at something like the top of the cluster, then you see there's similar kinds of article titles grouped together in this part. Um, though obviously we'd want to get like an epidemiologist or a biochemist to actually thoroughly evaluate if these make a lot of sense. Um, so moving down through, um, I did a couple more clusters. Then I did a, kind of a semantic search on the various titles. So one of the problems, as I said, from the get-go, these are 768 dimensional embeddings that are returned by the BERT model. Um, so they take up a lot of space. So it's just not practical to really do a full search of the corpus. And because I was limited to only embedding 200 articles, I think some of the results weren't that great uh, to begin with because I could only essentially embed it in 200 word chunks due to the, or 200, 200 article chunks due to the size of the titles. So, um, so yeah, that was definitely a limitation. I did try as a possible kind of unsupervised evaluation metric. Specifically, I thought, you know, if we have two kind of different queries, like one is coronavirus person to person transmission mechanics, and the other one is coronavirus infection, um, infection origin and transmission from animals. These, these are actually two fairly different questions from kind of, um, you know, a, a research standpoint. So why a normal search engine might return those have those return similar results. Ideally, we want them to return very different results. So what I did is I took those two queries, then I embedded the 10 return results. And you can see that these aren't very good because like, ideally we'd still see like distinct, I guess distinct areas in the kind of embedding space where the different search results should return just qualitatively. And they're kind of mixed. There's kind of even some overlapping ones. But again, this is kind of just on the, the partial kind of corpus and not the full, uh, the full one, just about 200 articles in the search. So a little bit's kind of understandable. Later on, I kind of went to embedding abstracts, which of course, full abstracts, which was even more RAM intensive, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I did, I did finally combine it with what was called the B25, BM25 index, which is kind of a more kind of vanilla search algorithm, similar to TF-IDF with a few slight variations. Um, and one of the things I found is that when I combine that on the search abstracts with that um, and have it return an initial list of 20 results on the four full like 45,000 articles and then reweight those results with semantic search, um, I did actually get more distinct clusters. So for instance, here's like coronavirus human to bat transmission um, Kegel kind of cut off some of the edge there, but, um, and here's COVD-19 person to person transmission. And all these, though these aren't perfect, you can see there's kind of like, these abstracts do like form, I guess, their own kind of distinct pattern in the embedding space. And there is some differentiation between the two, unlike the other one that where they were just kind of overlapping. So that was kind of my first attempt. I came up with these conclusions and next steps so one of the things I've looked at most recently was then fine tuning a, actually a sentence transformer model uh, on med NLI, which is one of the, which is essentially a, um, well, it's a natural language inference data set. Oh, oops, that's not actually mine. Um, which is a natural language inference data set, but it can be used to like gauge how similar sentences are together based on the labels in that. Um, so I fine-tuned that as full sentence transformer model. To and this model is actually nice because it produces full kind of sentence embeddings. Uh, I haven't done the full clustering analysis on it yet, but from what I've seen from the initial results, at least uh, qualitatively on a few things, like 
with, for instance, you know, um, bat to human transmission and camel to human transmission mechanism, it rates it like, for instance, a fairly high similarity score, which I think would be good. Um, and then for instance, if you're looking at like treatment efficiency of chloroquine on COVD patients and bat to human transmission, coronavirus, it rates it with a fairly lower similarity score, which, which we'd want because those are essentially two queries asking very different questions. So I've seen qualitatively just on this basic analysis is that it uh, seems to be performing um, a lot better, I guess. Um, okay, I think that covers most of what I was going to go over. Uh, as I said, uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting project. And uh, yeah, uh, that was kind of a bit informal, but uh, I, I was just asked, I think two days ago or a day ago to prepare this. So hopefully it still made sense to people. Happy to answer any questions. This is really great. Thank you so much. I see questions coming in already. Uh, can you see the chat? Oh, I'll pull it up. Let's see. Cool. Um, oh, I might have to stop sharing my screen. This is the hardest part to figure out if you like stopping the sharing of the screen. It's okay. All right. Okay, so yeah, okay. Nice to the chat. Um, so. Okay, so um, can we use UMAP? for other things than you have used it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, you can use Unimap for any type of clustering. So anytime you have embeddings or you wanna do dimensionality reduction, you can use Umap. It actually serves as kind of a good dimension. I was thinking of also actually using it, I guess, to maybe reduce the dimensionality of those 768 dimensional vectors to maybe take up a little less memory, but it's a good just dimensionality reduction technique in general. Um, and yeah, I can definitely add some article uh, links to it. I think I already linked to it in a couple places in my notebook, but. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a really good question about the RAM intensiveness. So, so yeah, these models are kind of hard at scale. So that's why I think most people do use some kind of initial search index where you return an initial list of results before doing the kind of similarity scores, which is what I was looking at. There are ways, I guess, as I said, to maybe try to use UMAP to reduce the dimensions uh, of the embedded text. So that can definitely help too. I haven't really studied that entirely at this point. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely is a question between how much RAM and resources are available and then uh, how good you want the search results to be. So that's one of those like kind of real world trade-offs you have to weigh. Do we have any more questions? Isaac, do you want to yeah, do you help? I, sorry, do you mind if I ask one <laughs> verbally instead of in the chat? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Isaac, could you tell us a little bit more about some of the stuff that the Corona Y group is up to? Yeah, sure. So actually, um, yeah, on Corona Y, it's kind of created four different main tasks. One focused on, um, and you can see them all on kind of the Corona Y page one focused on kind of geography and how geographic factors influence the virus. Another focused on uh, transmission specifically, another focused on um, vaccines and uh, other therapeutics. And the fourth is on various risk factors associated with it. So, um, so yeah, there, there's those four kind of core tasks which people are doing very specific kind of NLP efforts on. Um, so for instance, on the geo section, they're extracting specifically like named entities from the medical, uh, named entities of like locations um, and sub-level stuff about, you know, countries and then combining that with like geographic data to look at um, how, you know, geography impacts it in the sp and it's spread at least from the literature. Then like on say like the vaccines and therapeutics, they're looking at specifically extracting the vaccine and, you know, therapeutics info. Um, so yeah, there are kind of multiple efforts going on um, right now. Uh, I've been more focused on kind of the common effort, which is kind of to find general models that could work across all tasks. So that's where those kind of sentence embeddings come in. But uh, 
but yeah, it's, it's kind of a definitely an interesting group and a lot of cool things going on with it. Uh, do you know what the link to the Slack community is? I can drop it in the chat if you give it to me. Uh, the link to the Slack. Yeah, I can yeah. send out. Yeah, I can get you a link. Gotcha. And then I also posted a link to our Slack community. I see two more questions, one from Money, one from Jonathan. Okay, um, yeah, sure. So Jonathan asks, have you, considered, uh, have you considered visualizing any attention components for your transformers? Yeah, I think that could definitely be useful. Uh, I didn't do it too much in that notebook, but yeah, I think it would be useful to see like kind of which, which words are being kind of uh, weighed, um, kind of weighed in the language model uh, when embedding the, and when creating the embedding. So that definitely would be a good thing to do, see like which, particularly which tokens, and if it's attending to something like coronavirus or COVD-19 more, that would be helpful to know. But yeah, that would be a good next step too. So I have a question that piggybacks off of that. Uh, so I'm actually building this into weights and biases right now, attention mechanisms, um, a way to visualize them. What are you using right now to visualize your attention? Uh, or like uh, for other projects, because you haven't used it in this. Yeah, so for attention right now, I kind of try to use heat maps and stuff between kind of the input, you know, whatever the input is and whatever the output sequence is. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's the big one right now. Um, I guess you could also look at specific context vectors and kind of visualizing those could also definitely be helpful. Um, uh, so are you using Plotly maps right now to uh, visualize the heat maps? Um, I actually haven't heard of them, uh, them specifically. Right now I've kind of done some of my own embedding uh, kind of visualizations of kind of the activations, but I might look into them. I haven't done too much into the actual kind of uh, visualizations, but I think that could definitely help with interpretability, so. Cool. Uh, there was another question on dimensionality reduction. Uh, would you translate it to feature selection? Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of related to that. It's basically just uh, UMAP, PCA, TSON, they all take kind of like a very high dimensional vector and then they try to find, you know, the, the, the parts of it that really stick out and like define it in the kind of embedding space in simple terms and then map it to the, use those to map to the low dimensional embedding space. 